Dale. I don't hear a smile in your face on your face this morning, man. You you, you sound like you're 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 ready for some bear. What's going on? I'm not in England. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Have you ever been to England? No, I haven't. So that that's why there's no smile. Oh, that's, I haven't been there either. My next door neighbor is from England, though. He was actually born there. Alistair it, is his name. Alistair. The only time I've been out of the country, except for you know Toronto or. Tijuana, which we won't talk about. <laughs> Most people don't talk about Tijuana because they don't remember the trip. Yeah. <laughs> right. I went to New Zealand a oh, few my. years ago. Mm-hmm. Had a, spoke to a couple education groups in New Zealand. That was an amazing trip. That had to be, what, a 24-hour flight? Uh, 15 hours. 15? And you cross the, cross the international date line. So uh, I lost the day going down, coming mm-hmm. back. I left New Zealand at 4.30 on Saturday afternoon and got to Houston, Texas at 2.30 on Saturday afternoon. That kind of blew my mind a little bit. <laughs> That's pretty neat. I like that. Yeah. Uh, you may have added a day on your life, but yeah. then you gave it back. It's pretty neat, but the jet lag's got to be awful. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. I would like to do that so I could then play the right numbers that day. <laughs> well, I, I looked. I looked in the newspaper when I left New Zealand, and they didn't give me the Powerball number. They didn't give you that. That'd be the one advantage I think I would do. The did you have any trouble with the language when you went to New Zealand? No, no. I it, they uh, really embraced their native uh, customs and language, and so when they would speak the native, the Polynesian uh, or Maori is uh, the the group, and and I I didn't understand that. They had more trouble understanding my southern West Virginia <laughs> accent than I did there. Do, uh, do we share similar education goals and concerns uh, with New Zealanders? Uh, yes, we do. It, it, I actually went down after the 2018 uh, work action. They, were, they have a national uh, contract. They, they negotiate nationally for their education system. And they were getting ready to vote on, on whether to accept the, the contract offer or not. That's the reason they had me come down. And, and they, their minister of uh, education, they had elected uh, earlier to really do great things in education. And of course, when, he, when they got in office, they, they heard the same things. We want to do more, but you know, we have this problem and this problem and this problem, and we can't invest like we should, but, and when I got up to speak, I said, we want to do more, but, gosh, I thought I was in West Virginia there for a minute, and uh, <laughs> brought the house down, so. Very nice. Well, let's get back and, to know, West every, Virginia. Every, every, everywhere wants to do more for public education, but investing in the kids is, comes to be a different thing. There's always other things that become their priorities. Let's talk about this school year, uh, Dale, as we get ready to close it out here over the next uh, uh, week and a half or so, or depending on what district you're in and you know, the, at the last day is. Uh, your thoughts on whether this year measured up to what you thought it would be at the beginning of the year? And, and if you missed, uh, did you miss high or did you miss low? Well, I, I think our educators did an outstanding job under trying circumstances. When you had more than 1,500 vacancies across the state of West Virginia or 1,500 positions that didn't have a certified teacher in them. When you had a a tremendous lack of substitutes across the state and people were uh, giving up their planning period to cover classes or covering combining classes and things like that, uh, they're exhausted, number one. But but number two, overall, I, I think our educators did a tremendous job in what they did, and I think that will bear out when we when we see some results later on. When I'm looking at some of the uh, uh, graduation data that that we're getting, you know, our, our kids are doing well. In regards to solving the issues of personnel in the 2023-24 school year, Dale, what is the battle plan? Well. Uh, you know, we, we've had raises each of the four of the last five years, and we still dropped to 50th in the nation in pay. We're just not keeping pace with the, the other states, particularly the contiguous states. Uh, you, you see it over there. 
much more than than uh, most anyone else when uh, Loudoun County and, and all these other counties are paying twenty thousand dollars more. That that's a no brainer for kids coming out of college and and having student debt and everything else. They're going to leave and when as soon as they get the opportunity to to make the more money. So we're going to have to make an investment in in our salaries and our people, and it's going to have to be a long term investment and and a meaningful investment. Uh, there was a bill in, in House Ed in the beginning of this session that raised beginning salaries to $44,000. And, of course, it raised everyone else's salary, too. But but that was a substantial move, and it died in, in uh, House Finance, of course. I think that might have been Mike Hornby's bill, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, and what is the current starting salary in the state, Dale, roughly? Well, it's about thirty nine. Somewhere around there. John Gilstrap. In this morning's newspaper, good morning, uh, in this morning's uh, journal, there's an editorial that brings up a a report from the West Virginia's Board of Education. And one of the statistics in this report, that was in 2022, 19%, 19%, a fifth of all students during the 2022 school year were referred for a disciplinary incident. And of those, 56% were suspended. Uh, what's going on? I mean, this, that's that's a lot. I mean, it feels like a lot. Well, Maybe. It, it is a lot. And, and I've spoken the last two of the last three state board meetings, I've spoken about we have to address the, the mental and emotional health and welfare of, of our students. Our students are coming to school with problems that we couldn't imagine years ago, you know, in, in our day, uh, so to speak. And we have to figure out a way to to help them emotionally, help them uh, understand how to how to behave, how to uh, conduct themselves in the classroom. And I, the last couple of board meetings, I go back to 2014 when we had an innovation zones project that put uh, an alternative setting in elementary schools and some of our elementary schools followed it, where a disruptive student could be removed from the classroom and you work not only on the academics but the behavior issues what you saw the results was that is that the behavioral issues uh, went down and the academic achievement went up Uh, unfortunately we stopped doing that because we stopped funding innovation zones but if we don't address these issues at an early age and and if you wait until they're in middle school or high school you've lost them you have kindergarten kids now that are attacking people and hitting people. And uh, I had a kindergarten uh, student that stabbed a little girl with a pencil. I mean, come on. We, we have to address these uh, issues. We have to, to figure out how to, to reach these kids with their emotional issues. Is there a teacher component to this with, with all the shortages and all the stress and um... – I know that according to this article, the teachers have to go through a lot of training to address much of, of what you're talking about and is going to happen during the summer. Um, but do you think there's also the, the fatigue of the teachers? Does, does that lead to, um, I don't know, there are two parts to, it, to an interaction, right? So uh, does that I, lead I to an impatience that leads to suspensions? I, I think there's, there's several issues. Uh, uh, in many cases, the administrators' hands are tied. There, there's nowhere to put them because now, where where you used to have in-school suspensions and and ev- in most schools and everything like that, with the teacher shortage, you're seeing less and less of that. So you have that cuts down on your options. Uh, but it, you know, it's part of a large part of it's a breakdown of the family unit and and uh, not getting the kids the things that they need. Uh, from not only in school but but at home too. But it sort of sounds like an unsolvable problem from this it's side of the equation. Unsol- it's not an unsolvable problem at all. It's not an unsolvable problem at all. If if we, uh, uh, but it's going to take everyone working together to solve this. It's going to take not only the educators, but the parents, the grandparents, the community. It's going to take everyone involved to to figure out how to reach these kids and do what's best for these kids. And it's going to take 
um, some some professionals. You're going to have to have some some uh, counselors at, at the earliest ages to to address these issues. Matt Miller. Dale, when you mention, you know, it's it's going to take a lot of people to be involved, it sounds like some of that education, if you will, has to go to those parents. Are there, there are programs that are set up when you've got especially repeat offenders, if you will, that are being suspended and kids that are going through those, those difficult challenges that are making their schooling that much more difficult? Is it an opportunity to bring parents in and try to work with them, or is that even more of a challenge because the parents just aren't interested well I, I, we have uh, community and schools in in uh, a large number of our counties now across the state and I think we're, we're the first lady's goal is to get it in all 55 counties and, and when we have a lot of parents who who don't feel comfortable going into the schools and uh, why is that issues. Well, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, maybe they had bad experience themselves. Maybe uh, uh, school didn't didn't help them to become something more in life like like uh, it should. There's a lot lot of reasons behind that. Or, but but we have to figure out how to bring them in and, and get them involved. Uh, I go back to uh, helping students with with homework. You know, I'm I'm a math person. I, I taught math. I, I I see numbers in my head. But if you don't use a certain math, you lose it. Uh, I I had I took algebra two in in high school back in in 1974, and, and I know I don't sound that old. Uh, That's that not old, Dale. Me. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but. Then when I started teaching and, and taught a, an Algebra two class, I had to refresh myself on those skills again because it had been a number of years since, since I'd used them and, and you lost them. Um, parents, the same thing. We, we need to bring them in and, and help them uh, regain those skills to, to help their students with, with homework and things like that. Yeah, we've talked a lot about the teacher shortage. Uh, do you look at this right now and see this still as the aftermath of COVID and coming out of all of that and that this is going to turn around? Or does this seem to be a different problem that's going to kind of stay for a while? This is a national problem, and, and a big part of it is, is the lack of respect given to our educators. Uh, when, when you have... Uh, legislature after legislature across this nation that are uh, demanding that teachers teach a certain way, a certain style, uh, won't give them the professional courtesy that, that they know what their students need. Um, you're, you're just showing a lack of respect to our profession. And uh, more and more people are leaving the profession. So it's, it's a national problem that we have to address with, with more than just salaries it's it's giving that respect back to our educators and putting trust in their professional uh, values and, and professional expertise you mentioned more than just salary earlier you talked about surrounding areas and and particularly here in the eastern panhandle Loudoun county is so close by uh, and we're never going to be able in the state of west virginia to pay a teacher what they can be paid in Loudoun county so there's always going to be that lure for them to go elsewhere I, i'm assuming that what we need to do is to be able to pay in a range as far as the cost of living that that may make it harder for a teacher to say, you know, look, look for what I make here in the cost of living, I'll, I'll work and stay right here as opposed to traveling 25, 30, 40, 45 minutes every day one way just to get to my job in order to make a little bit more money. Right. You have to do that. And, and one of the ways that I – and this – you all get me in trouble every time I come on over there, but uh, – one of the ways you do that is is uh, reduce the local shares and, and let let each county keep more of their local tax dollars, but make sure that that money goes towards salaries and benefits. If you reduce the local shares down to right now it's at ninety percent. If you reduce it to eighty percent, so that uh, your county's keeping ten percent more of your tax dollars, 
and you put that towards salaries or, or housing or cost of living or, or those types of things, uh, that makes you more competitive. And, and that's something that, that can actually pass in the legislature because it benefits all 55 counties. We spend a lot of money in this state on education. Are we top-heavy, though, in how we spend it? Is enough of that money getting down to the level where the student is being affected, or is too much of it in higher administration that, as you mentioned earlier, may tend to tie the hands of teachers or, or have a disrespect to those very teachers? Well, one of the things that's it's very misleading when, when we look at the numbers of the actual dollars that's spent for education, uh, we're, we're in, one of the, in one of the top probably 10, 15 percent of the nation in dollars spent when you look at just dollars spent for education. But if you take out of that, we're one of the few states that have a statewide uh, retirement system. And remember, we have a 40-year plan. We're paying for the sins of the past. We put over $400 million a year into the retirement system to make up for the years that they didn't put anything. Uh, we're one of the few states that have a statewide health insurance system. So if you take out the, the retirement and the health insurance and that, and you look at just actual dollars going into the education, we rank about uh, 35th, 36th, 37th, somewhere around there in actual dollars going into education. Now, to answer your question, are we top-heavy administratively? I'm sure there are places where we are, uh, but but in other places, you're not, uh, like like. A work county, for example, uh, they they have three schools. How, how can they be top heavy administrative? We're looking at uh, colleges and universities that are are going through graduations, uh, perhaps have already gone through graduations. Is now the time that um, I, I know individual counties are looking to begin to fill those positions even before the school year ends. But uh, even in your position with the Education Association, is now the time that the push needs to be made to, to try to fill those 1,500 positions or certainly make sure that that number doesn't grow? No, we, we, if we're waiting till now, we're, we're too late. Mm. Uh, we, we had to do it a lot earlier. And part of the problem is the number of students going into education. Uh, you have some colleges who have dropped their programs back. You have colleges that have dropped certain uh, majors uh, back. Uh, the number of students that are graduating in education now, uh, college students, has, has uh, continually to dwindle. And so that's if, – if we're waiting till now, we, we've missed the boat. It occurs to me, you know, the, when I was – if you were taking Algebra two in 74, we're pretty much the same age. And when, um, <laughs> when I was growing up, you know, childhood, the school was a place of innocence and of learning and uh, not all of it pleasant. Um, but, you know, it was, it was a place to escape to. And it occurs to me that now, in the last few years – schools and school children have become pawns in a larger political game and it's not a it's not sure. a left thing and it's, and it's not a right thing it's just it seems to me that the school experience and lockdowns and all of this it's just getting less pleasant and less innocent and a few days ago we had rebecca catlett who's the berkeley county teacher of the year on and we asked the question you know it's, it's how do you fix the problems and she said something very telling i thought it really affected me she said every decision we make we make it for what's best for the children and then mm -hmm. everything else will follow so kind of Absolutely. adding on to matt's question about how we're spending money are the are the kids coming first in the in whether it's the legislature or the administration of of the schools uh in my opinion in the legislature, no. Uh, we we I, this this legislative session was a good example of that I spoke in in Senate Education a couple a couple times and and one of them there were two bills and in one of the bills Senator Roberts uh, got the bill defeated because it was going to put mandates on private schools, parochial schools, church schools, so so forth, so on, and so they defeated that bill. The very next bill added mandates to our public schools. And when I spoke, I said, you, you just defeated a bill that would have added mandates to private schools or home schools, 
and now you want to add more mandates to public schools? Indeed. And uh, sen- the senator from Ohio County said, well, don't you think we have the right to do that? Our public dollars are being used for our public schools. So under that scenario, then you have the right to do it for private schools and, and homeschoolers because our public dollars are now going to that. Uh, I'm I'm looking right now in, in where all this Hope Scholarship money is going. Uh, would you would you be, be shocked to know that uh, there are pu- West Virginia tax dollars in Hope Scholarship that are going to a public school out of state for a kid? Why are why are dollars going to a public school? I, I understand that it was allowed for charter schools and private schools and whatever, because, but why a public because school? Because the, the, the Hope Scholarship Board established that that was the same as a private school. And uh, so, so our public school dollars, our taxpayer dollars that are taken away from the public school in West Virginia are going to a public school in Ohio. Now, that's wrong. Something is wrong with that scenario. I got to find out more details about that one because that part is news to me. Uh, well, it, it happened in in Brook County in Steubenville uh, City Schools. Is it just one student, or are there more? I, I, that's what I'm investigating. I don't know that yet. Interesting. I, I know it's at least one student. Uh, just about out of time, Dale. How much longer are you going to do this? Well, I just got reelected for a three year term. Um, but I, I, I don't know that I'll I'll make it all three years. We'll we'll see. Do you know? I'm, I'm, when, I, I told you I'm old and and uh, you know <laughs> all the travel and everything. I, I I still I still enjoy what I do. I still think there's things that we need to accomplish in West Virginia, and, and I still put students first. And and as long as I do that, then I'll I'll continue. All right, you got an old ball coach story for me today, Dale. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I've thought about that, and, and uh, uh, I, I, I had to. Re- when I'm getting old, my memory starts to fail. Did, have I told you that the story about us playing Oak Hill Academy three years in a row? No. Uh, in a blind in a blind draw. Uh. Uh-uh. We we had we had good teams at Princeton, but uh, Oak Hill had Carmelo Anthony and Steve Blake and that group. And a blind draw three years in a row, we get we meet them in the first round of the, the Cole Classic tournament. Uh, the odds on that are phenomenal. I, I checked Vegas, and, and I, I could have won a mint if I would bet we would draw them three years in a row. But we are playing them once when they had Carmelo, and it's we had a good team, had a 6'8 center. It's 17 to nothing before we got the ball to half court. <laughs> The head coach looks at me and said, you think we're going to score? I said, score? Fred, I hope we just get the ball past half court. <laughs> but uh, but we did score, and, and we did did come back some. Of course, we, we didn't win the game. But uh, we had a player for us then, Tyrone Gilliard, that uh, went on to play four years, started safety at Pitt yep. in football. I remember him. And uh, – uh, until LeBron James broke the record against Oak Hill Academy, Ty had the most points scored against Oak Hill Academy at that point. I remember so, Ty. I, I fully remember when he committed, too. Yeah. Sounds like yeah, you're not buying that blind draw either. <laughs> no, I didn't buy that blind draw at all. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, uh, Dale, I wanted to ask you a, a last question here, too, and that is that uh, former state senator Billy Wayne Bailey has yes. passed good, away. Good friend. I didn't know how well you knew Billy. I assumed you knew him some. Uh, actually, uh, when he was the sheriff in Wyoming County, my mom was the cook for him at the at the jail. So uh, I, I, our families have known each other uh, our whole lives. He he was a, a good friend of mine. Uh, my mom loved him dearly. My, as a matter of fact, before you called, my younger brother called and and talked about Billy Wayne and and mom just thought he was just a wonderful person and, and uh, he treated her so kindly I, I hate to hear of his passing he, he was a, a really good guy he was a character but he was a really good guy dale thank you appreciate your thoughts okay thank you have a good day sir you too <laughs> bye-bye wvea president dale lee at 903